tonight, parties busted and charges laid. We understand everyone's frustration, uh, but there is a stay-at-home order out. Some people are still not listening. Toronto police responding to numerous calls last night about large gatherings. Plus, you do what you can do to look out for yourself because no one else will do it at Canada Post. A major COVID-19 outbreak at a Canada Post facility in Mississauga. Why one Canada Post employee says he doesn't feel safe at work. And, and we must meet this moment as the United States of America. It's a new era. Joe Biden calling for unity as he is sworn in as the 46th president of the United States. Good evening. I'm Kelda Yoon. CBC News has learned the first two Canadians diagnosed with the UK variant of COVID-19 are facing public health charges. Court filings have now revealed their identities. A Toronto area family doctor and her husband. Here's Jonathan Gatehouse with the exclusive details. Public health officials in Durham have charged a physician with deliberately misleading COVID-19 contact tracers. Dr. Martina Weir and her husband Brian are accused of repeatedly failing to provide accurate information on all persons they may have had contact with during their communicability for COVID-19 and obstructing public health officials by providing false information in relation to the UK variant strain. CBC News has learned that a close family member of the Weirs traveled from London in mid-December to spend Christmas with them. Brian Weir works as a scheduler for Toronto Paramedic Services. Dr. Martina Weir works at two Durham Region long-term care homes and three Lake Ridge Health Hospitals. A spokesperson for the long-term care home says Dr. Weir was off work for more than a month and that there are no concerns about risks for residents. An internal review of Weir's employment is now underway. This bioethicist says the public has a right to know about accusations against health care workers. There's no question that healthcare workers have an elevated moral responsibility. You know, you're in a position of trust with the public. The UK variant was only detected in the couple by chance when their positive COVID-19 tests were screened for it at random. In a statement to CBC News, lawyers for the Weirs say they will be pleading not guilty and will vigorously defend the case. The couple's first appearance in Provincial Offences Court is scheduled for March 10th. And if convicted, they could each face fines in excess of $5,000. As for Dr. Weir's licensing body, the college says countering public health best practices at any time, including during a pandemic, is not acceptable behavior. And that any complaints will be thoroughly investigated. Jonathan Gatehouse, CBC News, Toronto. A long-term care home in Barrie is facing a possible outbreak of a variant strain of COVID-19, though they don't yet know what strain it is. Lab testing has identified it in six swabs so far. The Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit says the swabs from Roberta Place indicate a very high probability that they are of a variant strain of concern. Results are expected in three to four days. As of Sunday, more than 100 people at the home were confirmed to be infected with COVID-19. The province-wide stay-at-home order has been in place for a week now. Many had found the rules a bit confusing, but one thing was clear. Large gatherings are a no-no. Despite that, some people are still throwing parties. Toronto Police attended numerous calls about large gatherings last night, a few of them resulting in charges. Ali Chiasson has more. Who parties on a Tuesday? Well, I mean, besides, I love my Conan and Drake that one time. A lot of people, apparently. The Toronto police responded to 11 calls for large gatherings last night. Mostly in different divisions, from Etobicoke to Black Creek, Kensington Market, the beaches to Scarborough. Calls were coming in throughout the night, from just after 8 o'clock to 2 o'clock in the morning. The stay-at-home orders has been affected in now for a week. Right now, up to date, we have 69 charges, provincial charges that have been issued. These calls coming in are, are you know, coming in from either neighbours or people that see, you know, uh, random people going into a residence or there seems to be a lot of vehicles parked on a driveway uh, or it could just come through like a tip line. The only assumption I can have at, uh, with, with 11 calls on a Tuesday is everyone is just stuck at home. We are appealing and urging people to just, you know, as much as you would like to, do your part, stay home, 
uh, and, and not go visit friends and family until, uh, until we can get this COVID-19 under control. There's been a concerning gray area around enforcement of the stay at home order. It doesn't give police sweeping powers to stop just anyone who's outside of their home. According to the Toronto police, they're focusing on responding to calls like these for gatherings. Officers will break up and ticket people at gatherings of more than five people outside. No one from outside of your household is allowed inside unless you live alone. Then you're allowed to pair up with one other household, but still no parties. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. Canada Post is dealing with a major COVID-19 outbreak at one of its main processing plants. More than 100 workers at a facility in Mississauga have tested positive for the virus so far this month. As Angelina King reports, this comes as the province begins ramping up workplace inspections. While your parcels are being sorted by Canada Post staff here, in another room, some are being tested for COVID-19. Public Health has ordered staff who work a certain shift at Mississauga's Gateway East facility be tested after 121 employees at the plant got the virus in the last three weeks. You do what you can do to look after yourself because no one else will do it at Canada Post. CBC News is withholding the identity of this Canada Post worker. He doesn't work at the Gateway site, but says the outbreak is causing delays in mail service. They do all the parcels for most of the country, end up going through there at some point. His plant also experienced an outbreak. Do you feel safe at work? Oh, no. How come? Well, the hit and miss mask use was one thing. Um, you know, that was up until last week. And... You know, a lot of our facilities are older buildings. Canada Post says it's been following the guidance of public health and implementing rigorous measures to keep employees safe. Since the outbreak, Canada Post sent a letter to Gateway East staff outlining testing required by public health. It says rapid tests will be administered at work. Employees can get tested in the community, but if they refuse to be tested, they must quarantine for 14 days. It also says testing will be available for all staff at the site. The focus is uh, really on trying to get more uh, rapid testing into these settings to help identify and stop outbreaks uh, sooner. Today, Ontario announced it's ramping up workplace COVID enforcement. Since the pandemic, inspectors have found more than 35,000 instances of non-compliance. 61 workplaces have been shut down, six in the last week. The province says infractions are mainly from people not distancing and breaking mask protocol during breaks or traveling between job sites. We've learned it is these off-the-clock tasks that are leading to workers getting sick. That's going to change with our new Stay Safe All Day campaign. Inspectors are now visiting the kitchen and the break room. Canada Post says since the beginning of the pandemic, just over 1,000 employees got COVID across the country. Over three quarters of them have been cleared and are back at work. Angelina King, CBC News, Toronto. Schools in seven public health units in southern Ontario will reopen for in-person learning on Monday, with over 100,000 students returning to class. That doesn't include schools in the GTHA or in Windsor-Essex. Students in those regions will continue to learn from home until at least February 10th. Mayor Tory wants to bring back Cafe TO this year with improvements. Keeping it and making it better is the right thing to do, and I believe that the residents of the city and the businesses are strongly behind uh, this decision. He's putting his support behind a new report that will go to the mayor's executive committee next week. The report proposes making registration for the program easier and allowing businesses to build decks and platforms. Cafe TO was launched early in the pandemic, allowing restaurants and bars to open patios in curb lanes and along sidewalks. The aim is to have it back up and running in the spring. Well, now to a case of queue jumping for the COVID vaccine at a hospital in Orangeville. An executive at Headwaters Healthcare Center is retiring early after it was found he helped a family member get a shot of the vaccine reserved only for healthcare workers. Lorenda Redekop has more. A vaccine clinic at this hospital in Orangeville was supposed to be for healthcare workers. Someone there broke the rules. We uh, found out that 
a manager and one of her family members brought a family member in and didn't make any secret of that they were just uh, stepping in and jumping cute. The hospital's president and CEO, Kim Delahunt, confirms in a statement that a staff director at the hospital had an elderly family member vaccinated during a clinic on January 14th and that the family member was already at the hospital for other tests. This was a failure in sound decision making by one individual, she says, for which they and the hospital are deeply sorry. As a result, our staff director made the decision to retire. The manager did the probably the smartest thing going, you know, can I retire? And that's uh, probably a prudent move because I got to, I just, we would have been pushing for uh, dismissal. So we would have pushed another person fired. This is at a time when the vaccine is like liquid gold, especially with news that Canada won't be getting any Pfizer-BioNTech shipment next week. The union plans to keep an eye out for anyone not waiting their turn. One other case, the City of Toronto confirms eight health care workers got the shot before they should have at the short-lived Convention Centre Clinic. Only one of them has actually been associated with allergies in the past. But Ontario doctors are fighting a different problem. People worried about not wanting the vaccine, sometimes due to misinformation. Misinformationists out there um, are ahead of us, frankly. We are seeing the results of that. They have interacted very closely uh, with the black community uh, in um, Ontario, and I'm aware that um, hesitancy is a major concern there. They hope people will discuss doubts with their doctor or stick to official sources of information so that when there is enough vaccine, we'll reach herd immunity. Lorenda Radakop, CBC News, Toronto. The province's police watchdog has determined there are no grounds to charge a Peel police officer in the shooting death of a Mississauga man last year. According to the Special Investigations Unit, 28-year-old Jamal Francique was shot in his car last January by a Peel police officer during the course of being arrested. In a release issued today, the SIU said, based on a review of the evidence, there are no grounds to lay charges against the officer. According to Peel police, undercover officers were investigating a vehicle for suspected drug activity at the time. Police said Francique drove at them and, then, and that an officer fired several shots striking Francique. Seek. He was taken to hospital and remained on life support until he died days later. Francique's family said he suffered from schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Congratulations, Mr. Thank President. You. It was Inauguration Day in the United States. We'll have more on the historic day and look at how the change in administration may impact the tech industry here in Canada. Coming up, plus... Windy with some light blowing snow through the overnight hours. I'm meteorologist Colette Kennedy. What's in store after that? I'll have your forecast coming up after the break.
In an inauguration like no other, Joe Biden has been sworn in as the 46th president of the United States. He took the oath of office just before noon in Washington. And in his first formal address as president, Biden went straight to work on his pledge to unite a very divided America. This is our historic moment of crisis and challenge. And unity is the path forward. And we must meet this moment as the United States of America. If we do that, I guarantee you we will not fail. The crowds at the ceremony were greatly reduced because of COVID-19 and security concerns springing from the attack on the Capitol building two weeks ago. Another historic event of the day was the swearing in of Kamala Harris as the first woman vice president in U.S. history. Well, Donald Trump broke precedent after precedent during his four years as president, and today was no different. He flew to Florida just before Joe Biden's inauguration. But in his parting words, Trump promised to be back. So just a goodbye. We love you. We will be back in some form. Without mentioning Biden by name, Trump wished the new administration good luck, but he is still refusing to concede the election. While he may be a private citizen now, Trump still faces trial in the Senate after becoming the first U.S. president to be impeached twice. Trump will live at his Mar-a-Lago Resort Club in Florida, but his residency could face a legal challenge from his wealthy neighbors. During Trump's time as president, Toronto's post-secondary institutions and tech industry saw a big boost with people wanting to migrate north. The University of Toronto, for example, reported an 80 percent spike in applications from American students the year after Trump took office. The question now is, will interests remain under President Biden? Chris Glover looks into that. U.S. sociology professor Jerry Flores made a quick decision November 8, 2016. With offers from two American universities also in front of him, he picked the Toronto one. That election night, I took my contract from, from U of T, I signed it and I sent it along and I said, we're going. I almost felt like, you know, we're, we're packing up the station wagon and driving all night and just getting on out of here. The U.S. citizen with Mexican-born parents couldn't live in Donald Trump's America. There was a very real and tangible fear for anyone who didn't fit into this like traditional box of what an American should look like, American in quotes, um, it was scary. So many looked north that night. Canada's immigration website crashed. Officials say some 100,000 people in America logged on. Flores's fear morphed to disgust as he saw undocumented children separated from their families at the U.S. southern border under Trump. It was grotesque and disgusting, but unfortunately, these are all things that I've seen in, in, in the history of, of the U.S. population. Since then, Trump has systematically increased red tape within the U.S. immigration system, temporarily suspending some work permits in June 2020. Ottawa-based e-commerce company Shopify pounced. Trump not only imposed immigration restrictions when he chilled the climate for foreign talent, uh, a lot of that talent came up to Canada. Richard Florida with U of T's Rotman School of Management says Trump also made Canada more enticing for other international citizens. Biden is going to dramatically scale back, eliminate most of the restrictions uh, on international students and on global talent, and he's going to open the floodgates. As that competitive advantage erodes under Biden, Toronto needs to seek emerging companies, especially in tech and environment, says a Toronto organization that attracts international investment. We want to be in every boardroom in the U.S. where companies say, you know what, here, here's an option, let's go to Canada. You know what, my station wagon's currently snowed in, so we're staying put for a little bit. <laughs> Flores says the U.S.'s brain bleed under Trump will be long-lasting. And I think, unfortunately, for the U.S., uh, you know, they're experiencing a huge drain in lots of different ways, uh, a drain in, uh, in diverse uh, perspectives and realities. Chris Glover, CBC News, Toronto. Cloudy and windy with flurries developing overnight. Currently minus three downtown, but feeling more like minus 10. Colette Kennedy joins us now. And Colette, I was out for a bit earlier. Definitely starting to feel a lot more like January. I know these temperatures will be rising, though, as we get into the overnight. 
Yeah, they will be. So this was sort of your preview there. We all got a chance to feel, oh yeah, this is what January and winter <laughs> is supposed to feel like. We've been feeling it today and now we're going in the other direction, but it's going to be short lived. Along with that, and the reason our temperatures rising, those winds picking up from the southwest overnight as the system goes through and giving us a little bit of blowing snow as well. So for shift workers, do know that there will be some reduced visibility and some slick roadways. So through the overnight hours, that'll be clearing out tomorrow morning and rising rising temperatures tonight and tomorrow and then that's kind of it we start to cool down on Friday but really it's a secondary cold front that's going to go through later Friday night and for the weekend it is going to give us the gift of some Arctic air and it's going to stick around for more than just the weekend that's just when it uh, comes back to us all right our daytime highs today we haven't seen this in a while. Minus three are high. Again, this is just the high through the afternoon. Because the temperature is going to be rising, continuing still, uh, we're actually warmer than this, going to be getting warmer than this through the overnight. So it won't be at the end of the day, the official daytime high. So as the system kind of sneaks through, we get into some of this blowing snow. Relatively light though, it's just sometimes when it blows around, then it makes it seem like more. But light for the GTA, and we're talking about just kind of a dusting to a centimeter or a little further north and maybe a couple of centimeters but when we get up towards Owen Sound through Mount Forest the higher elevations different story because it will be compounded by the winds coming in and bringing in some lake effect into Thursday as we get into a westerly flow into Friday as well so those areas will be more significant in terms of what we're going to be seeing Otherwise, by Friday for the GTA sun, with just a few flurries at times coming off some of those streamers. Our wind gusts, though, those really picking up. So some of those wind gusts exceeding 50 kilometers an hour, they'll die off and then pick up a little bit. But really, it's tonight and into the day tomorrow when you're going to feel it, even though it will be milder. The snowfall, like I said, not much from the system sneaking through, but wait for it in this region once we get the lake effect coming. So some areas 10 to 15 centimeters is possible. A quick look at your temperature, southwestern Ontario with them rising so going up from where we are right now your highs up to three with some flurries there possible still through the day Windsor and overnight tonight this is what we're talking about those temperatures cool but coming up so mark them that minus six that'll be disappearing you're up to one by tomorrow into the afternoon hours Friday's that transition day there's that colder Arctic air look at this couple of overnight lows where we actually fall to seasonal for the first time we'll see if that happens but I'm expecting it Kelda. Wow. Thanks so much, Colette. The weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. We test, so it runs. It's hard to stop a train. After the break, she was arguably the star of President Biden's inauguration ceremony. We'll hear more from the 22-year-old who made history today as America's youngest inaugural poet. And so we lift our gaze not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our future first. We must first put our differences aside.
Before we go, a young woman that many say stole the show at today's inauguration, 22-year-old Amanda Gorman. The Youth Poet Laureate read her stirring poem, The Hill We Climb, at the swearing-in of President Joe Biden. Have a listen. We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace. And the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always just is. And yet the dawn is ours before we knew it. Somehow we do it. Somehow we've weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. We, the successors of a country and a time where a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother can dream of becoming president only to find herself reciting for one. And yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine, but that doesn't mean we are striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to forge our union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. And that is our show for you tonight. Thank you so much for watching. Dwight Drummond has your next local newscast tomorrow at 6. I will see you back here tomorrow night at 11. Have a great night.